Hello everybody, welcome to the stream. Tonight we are recording an extra episode of The Private Citizen. I hope you're doing all right. I was just gonna... took a bit longer to start the stream because I was figuring out what what my Discord was doing. It wasn't showing the um, that I'm streaming. Uh, but I think that's because uh, they reset all the, you know, reset the passwords after the hack. And I think they also reset all the um, app authorizations. And so I think I'll have to fix that after the stream. Um, right. Hope you're doing good. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm busy, but I'm, I'm good. I had a run earlier in in the rain. With seven kilos of uh, ballast, but it felt good. It felt good, and I'm not too tired now, which is good because you know, doing an extra episode now. Um, I'll be back on Wednesday with the regular episode. Uh, I'm doing an extra one because I've got so much stuff to talk about. It's just, it's basically way too much. Um, and with that, we already. It's pretty late. I need to get the show out before the day's over. So. Um, Let's um, let's test everything. Hello. All right. That seems okay. Look at the colors, colors, colors. That looks good. All right. Does it also sound good? All right. That's, I think that's good. I think that's all we need. Um, yeah. Um, I think. I think we're ready to roll. So, uh, hello, JJ Guevara. JJ Guevara. Good afternoon. Oh, uh, before I start, yes, that's a good. Thank you for coming in here, and I see you're a first time viewer or first time chatter, which is I like that Twitch is showing me that now. Um, so welcome to the channel. Um, there's something that you just reminded me of, which I have to do. I have to give this disclaimer, which is basically when I'm streaming games or something, I interact with chat all the time. Uh, but since I'm recording a podcast now. Uh, I will be. I will not be doing that as much, just so that that the podcast viewers, you know, uh, fuck's sake, this is starting off well, isn't it? Uh, the podcast listeners, because it's an audio podcast, right? And they'll be distracted. Um, they don't know what's going on because they're not watching this on Twitch. I mean, they can because I upload this to YouTube afterwards. But you know, I want to keep it a podcast. Um, oh, a long time six gun listener. Uh, hello. Why are you sorry? Thanks for dropping by. No, I'm just saying this. This is a good. You're prompting me to do this. It's good. I have to say this once in a while. Um, so I'll, I'm muting all alerts and everything um, when I'm doing this podcast. I, I, I interact with chat. Um, you know, if you give me some corrections and stuff, that's important. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy about like live feedback. I'm just keeping it to minimum, right? And I'm not like doing the hello, how are you, welcome to the channel kind of thing. Um, and of course. You know, it's it's kind of part of it's like live, live feedback. It's kind of a feedback section that I have at the end, but one that you know goes through the whole show. So it's it's valuable. Don't you know? Don't feel like you don't have to. You can you can say whatever you want, like normal. You know, I just just be aware when I'm not reacting to it. That's why. Um, right. And with that, let's let's get the show on the road, shall we? Let's see if I can do this uh, in one take, one once more. <clears throat> we'll see, we'll see, we'll see. You're listening to the private citizen defending your right to have something you ha to hide. Well, that wasn't one take, was it? <laughs> you know, 
I know. I'm. I, I. It's live to tape and whatever, and I can live with, you know. Um, imperfections, but I'd like to get the intro right, you know, just to just to give the semblance of professionality for the first like minute of the show. Let's try this again. <laughs> You're listening to The Private Citizen Defending Your Right to Have Something to Hide, your podcast about privacy and all those other pesky rights we uh, would like to have. This is... Oh God, what is... What, why? What's, what's going on today? This is like take three. We haven't had that in a long time. Normally I can take it on... Like Normally it works on the second one. Anyway, it is what it is. You're listening to The Private Citizen, defending your right to have something to hide your podcast about privacy and all those other pesky civil rights. This is episode 92 for Monday, the 25th of October, 2021. Bugs in our pockets. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the show. My name is Fab, coming to you live from the autumny city of Düsseldorf in Germany. In the west of Germany. I said Western Germany last time. Listen back to the last show. I said Western Germany. Makes me sound like I'm. This is a broadcast from the 80s, when podcast podcasting wasn't invented. Um, yeah, no, in the west of Germany. Um, this is a Monday episode. Um, it's an extra one. I'm gonna be back on Wednesday with a regular scheduled release. It's not like a special episode. It's just I've got so many topics. I might as well, you know, I, I get kind of the chance to you know, put one. Uh, squeeze one in there. That sounds weird. Uh, so, so I took it and I'm, um, you know, trying to give you some extra episodes. Also, I kind of have to do that one. Like, on on Wednesday, we'll be up to par with, like, the promises, promised releases of, you know, uh, one, one every week, basically, for the year, which is what I'm trying to do. So that's good. Anyway, today we are talking about uh, Bugs in Our Pockets, which uh, is a paper that was published um, a while ago now by a number of, um, you know, security crypto experts uh, who are basically arguing why uh, client-side scanning is bad. And um, client-side scanning, if you're new to the show, we talked about this quite a while. I've created a tag for it. No, we didn't have a tag. So if you go to Private Citizen Press, there are always copious show notes and there are tags at the top. And if you click on those, you can see all the other episodes that basically are connected uh, as, as best as I can. I'm doing this manually. Um, but in episode 32, how to hack end-to-end -end encryption, I basically talked about it. Um, I don't know if I called it client-side scanning. It's That's somewhat of a new um, way of a uh, new term for it. Uh, but basic, ba basically, wait, basically, basically what it is, is um, so if you have end-to-end -end encrypted communications, and we're talking, you know, the, the standard way was transport encryption, right? So you'd have to, uh, you're using an app or a client or whatever, and you're talking to a server or a website. Um, um, or maybe, no, that, that I mean, that would also, that would be transport encrypted, would also be end-to-end -end encrypted. No, but like if you're talking over a service, over web servers to another client or another phone or whatever app, then transport encryption would mean it's encrypted from me to the server and from the server to you. Um, it's in the clear on the server. Um, as a res largely as a response to the Snowden revelations, uh, pretty much anybody, everybody went to end-to-end -end encryption just to make it harder for the NSA and other services like that. And end-to-end -end encryption means it's encrypted from your, my device to your device and from your device to my device, including the server. So it's encrypted on the server. So the server the provider can't read 
the traffic. Now, there's people who want to read that traffic, uh, you know, for, you know, intelligence services, law enforcement, and they came up with an idea to still do that um, because they can't break the encryption. So what, what, or we think, you know, state-of-the-art crypto thinking is that what we have is good enough and even the NSA with their, you know, dark technology and huge server farms, uh, even those guys can't look into it. So um, they, you know, the other idea would be, so if you're doing that, if I'm talking, my phone, you know, I'm using an app, I'm talking to you on your phone, it's end-to-end -end encrypted. Um, you know, when I'm typing the message, it's in clear text. It then gets encrypted on my phone, gets sent encrypted to you, gets decrypted on your device in order to be shown on your screen, right? So you can intercept this communication on my phone before my phone encrypts it or on your phone after your phone has decrypted it. And that is what these days people call client-side scanning. Um, and that's what we're talking about today because there was a paper published, uh, like 60 pages. Um, it's more of an overview. I wouldn't like, it's not like a meta paper where you, like they're looking at studies. Um, no, it's more of a concise explanation of the problems that client-side scanning has. And it's by some very uh, well-regarded people. So that's that's the topic for the show. And I, you know, there's no housekeeping that I can think of. So uh, let's 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 crack straight into it, shall we? So uh, this paper is that's what I you know. Uh, titled the episode as well, it's called Bugs in Our Pockets, The Risks of Client-Side Scanning. And um, it is um, it is published by some well-known people. So I'm going to go through the, the most well-known on the list. Uh, we have Whitfield Diffie, who are people who, uh, you know, are in IT security or, you know, are interested in IT security might recognize from Diffie-Hellman fame i.e. Um, Diffie and Hellman co-invented uh, public key crypto, which is basically what the whole internet uses. Um, so um, when our two phones doing end-to-end -end encryption, they have to get a key that only we know, right? The secret that my phone knows and that your phone knows. So if I, if I write a message, encrypt that and send it to you, I need a way to send you that key. But I can't send you the key because anybody listening in will get the key. So uh, public key crypto or public private key crypto, it's sometimes called, um, you know, in German it's called that, um, is a way of handing over this key without handing over the key. If you want to know more, uh, you'd have to Google uh, Diffie-Hellman key exchange or public key crypto. Maybe someday I'm going to explain it on the show, although it's like, you know, I read how it works and then I like understand it, but not like on a, I'm not, you know, I'm not really good at math and stuff. So kind of understand it on a broad overview. And then I completely forget because it's, very, you know, every time afterwards, I'm like, if somebody puts me on the spot to explain it, it's very complicated and quite ingenious. Anyway, so we got Whitfield Diffie. We've got Ronald Rivest, uh, who uh, uh, is the R <laughs> in RSA. He, and not, I mean, not necessarily the company, but the algorithm. He co-invented the RSA algorithm, which is one of the most famous um, algorithms in, you know, computer science cryptography. Um, on this paper, uh, an author on this paper is also Stephen M. Bellowin, uh, who co-invented uh, encrypted key exchange. So this is a way, um, this is kind of how... Um, on early Unix machines, like that, that's you know how you make how you do logins on computers. Um, and he invent he created that, and he's also credited with inventing the firewall, or at least coming up with the idea of this. So, this is all like you know, old school Unix stuff, you know, 70s, 80s, maybe even 60s. Um, we got Josh Benelow, who invented the Benelow crypto system. Some people might have heard of that. Um, we have John Callis who is one of the founders of PGP Incorporated, so the company that created pretty good privacy, PGP, which is what you use if you use, you know, 
PGP encryption. Most people use it for email. It's also called GPG because that's the GNU privacy guard. I think that's the um, GNU free software implementation of PGP. Um, and uh, John Kellis is also the co-founder of Silent Circle, which creates messenger apps and to and phones, you know, uh, software on phones to do end-to-end -end encrypted stuff. Um, on the list is Peter Neumann, who is the editor of the Risk Digest. If you write about IT security or you're in the field, you know what the Risk Digest is. Uh, interestingly, also uh, Car Carmela Troncoso, who, uh, you know, we talked about lots of um, SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19. <laughs> we have a, an interesting uh, feedback on, on me uh, always complaining about uh, the naming and stuff uh, in the show notes. So uh, uh, in the show notes, in the feedback section, which is also in the show notes, if you want to skip ahead, private citizen or press. Um, but, you know, we talked, we talked a lot about that and the privacy impacts. And I talked about DP3T um, and, and uh, contact tracing. And I explained that when that came up. And Carmela, Carmela Trancoso, uh, was the main author of the original DP3T paper. And we have a number of well-known uh, crypto and security experts, including Bruce Schneier, who I think everybody knows. Um, if you don't read Bruce Schneier's blog, you probably should. It's very good. Uh, Bruce Schneier, Matt Blaze, and Ross Anderson. Um, and also some editors, uh, also well-known if you do a lot about cryptography. Um, Matthew Green, and Nicholas Papernot, they're both professors of cryptography, um, helped with the editing of this paper. So, um, you know, I mean, all of these people, I mean, most people will probably know uh, the names Diffie, Rivest, and Schneier. I mean, Bruce Schneier is probably the most known to um, non-IT security people um, because he's, you know, he's he, he does various speaking. He speaks a lot on the topic and is very good in explaining not only has he written very detailed books on uh cryptography but he's very good at explaining that as well to like lay people um i interviewed him i think last year for like a webinar um that was quite interesting um and yeah so so all these people are know what they're talking about right and they generally i think wrote this paper because we talked um Oh God, uh, what episode was that? I, I never, like, I, I should be putting that in the show notes, but I never do. Um, but, I, you know, yeah, I can just go to Private Citizen Press and click on the client side scanning tag and I can find out uh, in episode 81, we talked about Apple. Um, Apple in response, the episode was titled Let's Talk About Apple. <laughs> um, Apple in a response to uh, a number of law changes or upcoming law changes including in the eu um proposed a system whereby or a number of features uh, one of which where they would scan icloud um accounts you know obviously in the cloud cloud storage accounts for apple um users um for child pornography well that isn't so much that isn't new that's already other services already did that um, but they also proposed and created and already put into iOS um, a system whereby, or started putting it in, whereby they uh, would uh, scan photos from iMessage locally. And that's client sc side scanning, right? iMessage and to end encrypted messenger. Um, of course, uh, to filter out child pornography, um, which is always a good cause. And that's why that is always the first, you know, whenever anybody wants to introduce anything to, let's put it this way, spy on you. Um, the first, the, the argument they always bring is uh, child pornography because nobody, nobody can say, well, you know, child pornographers also have rights. That's not a popular, I mean, you can say that it's true, but it's not a very popular opinion and you get shouted down easily and everybody's always you know for the cause of stopping child pornography um so that's always the first that's always how they get their foot in the door in their door and as the as the authors of this paper i'm just going to call them the authors of this paper because they're quite a lot of people um as the authors of this paper later point out in the paper as well um that is always 
Like they, they get the foot in the door that way and then it's always too late, right? You got the technology, it's in everybody's devices and then the pressure is on on politicians and lawmakers to then later say, okay, let's lose it. It works so well to find the uh, pedophiles, right? So let's use it to find organize, organized crime, you know, to, to spy on organized crime, whatever. Uh, and then it ends up with political adversaries and, and pretty much everybody at the end. You know, nobody's ever rolling that back. Um, so that is, um, I mean, which is the thing, I mean, you know, talking about uh, COVID, SARS-CoV-2, I mean, that, that's a good example that you can see um, that these, you know, emergency measures, the emergency might be undeclared, right? It might be gone, right? They might say, okay, the emergency is over, but they're not taking the stuff out of the, the law. Nobody's ever doing that. And this is kind of the same situation. So um, I'd like to read, um, I'm, I'm going to read pretty much the whole introduction to this paper um, for you now, because that it sums it up very well. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about some other points they make. I mean, this sums up the main points very well. So the authors write, Our increasing reliance on digital technology for personal, economic, and government affairs, government affairs, underscore that, has made it essential to secure the communications and devices of private citizens, <laughs> like us, businesses, and governments. This has led to pervasive use of, of cryptography across society. Despite its evident advantages, law enforcement and national security agencies have argued that the spread of cryptography has hindered access to evidence and intelligence. And, you know, this is something that happens all over the world. It's not a US, US thing. It happens in Germany, the UK, you know, whatever country you are listening from right now, it's, it's a chance this argument has been brought up. Uh, with your local politicians by these same people. Some in industry and government now advocate a new technology to access targeted, targeted data, client-side scanning or CSS. Instead of weakening encryption or providing law enforcement with backdoor keys to decrypt communications, CSS would enable on-device analysis of data in the clear. If targeted information were detected, its existence and potentially its source would be revealed to the agencies. Otherwise, little or no information would leave the client device. Its proponents claim that CSS is a solution to the encryption versus public safety debate. It offers privacy in the sense of unimpeded end-to-end -end encryption and the ability to successfully investigate a serious crime. In this report, we argue that CSS neither guarantees eff efficacious crime prevention nor prevents surveillance. Indeed, the effect is the opposite. CSS, by its nature, creates serious security and privacy risks for all society, while the assistance it can provide for law enforcement is at best problematic. There are multiple ways in which client-side scanning can fail, can be evaded and can be abused. Its proponents want CSS to be installed on all devices rather than installed covertly on the devices of suspects or by court order on those of ex-offenders. But universal deployment tr threatens the security of law-abiding citizens as well as lawbreakers. Technically, CSS allows end-to-end -end encryption, but this is moot if the message has already been scanned for targeted content. And this is like the main point um, that I, I mean, I'm not a... I said this when I started the show. I'm not a privacy um, fundamentalist. I think too many people that are technically literate and, you know, that do write blogs and do podcasts have been that. Um, it's kind of like in the Linux world where I used to do a podcast. It was the same thing and I never tried to be that way. Um, it doesn't help you to be fundamentalist. Um, so I usually try to have you know as a journalist i'm writing for the general public or that's what i'm trying to do so i'm trying to balance let's put it this way most of you you know most of you probably but like me us nerds geeks whatever um against the normal people on the street um so i try to stay away from these black and white blanket statements but in some cases i think they're justified. And I think this is one of these cases. Um, so, so I believe as well, 
I don't know if I said it this clearly on the show before when you talked about this kind of thing, but I probably have. Um, if somebody can read the content of a message that is about to be end-to-end -end encrypted or was end-to-end -end encrypted, you know, afterwards, on the other end or whatever, then there's really no point of the end-to-end -end encryption. Um, it, I mean, and that's not even in a fundamentalist way. It's also in a very practical way because we end-to-end -end encrypt stuff. Um, well, first of all, so that the service providers can't read that, but mostly because, you know, le having learned from Snowden that intelligence agencies and law enforcement can get subpoenas to get this stuff from the service providers. So we basically do this end-to-end -end encryption stuff in like lots of people do it in a d direct um, consequence of what Snowden revealed of illegal or semi-legal or just clandestine or, or all of it, I don't know, spying by intelligence services. Um, and if such a CSS system, as they, you know, they call it CSS, I don't like that because that's, to me that's always cascading style sheets, but whatever. If client-side scanning, if that system exists, is created, then intelligence agencies will have access. They will be the first ones. So you might as well not encrypt, right? So the argument that, hey, yeah, so, but like your local police maybe can read it if it's important for, you know, child porn case, but you still say from the intelligence agencies, this, this bullshit, right? If your local police has access, you can be sure some intelligence service has as well um, because they're always the first in line for this kind of stuff. And they're the ones really pushing this stuff, I think. Um, so I think in this case, it's not only a, um, it's not so much a fundamental, it's just a pragmatic approach in this case. Like end-to-end -end encryption is only useful if you can be sure of the um, integrity of the channel up to that, right? Um, if you have to assume that they are in your phone, you might as well not encrypt. You might as well not use your phone, really, if you don't want them. I'm, I'm, I'm using this on purpose. Uh, the intelligence community uh, to read your messages. Um, yeah, and uh, I see in Twitch chat. Obviously, I'm sh I'm broadcasting the recording of the show live on Twitch as I'm apt to do. Um, the rest of Jim says. Why did they use an abbreviation that is already used for cascading style sheets? Um, yeah, that's my issue with that. So I will I will try to call it client side scanning. Um, you know, uh, might might as well call it client side spying um, because scanning kind of makes it sound like oh we automatically scan and we only look at the evil stuff, which is something they say right, but it's bullshit because. You know, you can just, somebody can just flip a switch in the code, the NSA, uh, which will do that. And then suddenly they get everything. I mean, it is, it has been demonstrated. Snowden has shown us that intelligence services like the NSA, it's not only the NSA, it's GCHQ. It's probably BND in Germany. You know, all these intelligence agencies, they want all data they can get. If they can... They don't want like, oh, this is a terrorist. We're spying on that that guy specifically. If they can get all the traffic, they will take it. That's what Snowden showed us. That's what they were doing. Um, <laughs> JJ Guevara says in chat, uh, it's the same reason here in Canada they call the Cybersecurity Awareness Month CSAM which otherwise is child sexual abuse material. Yeah, this CSAM abbreviation um, I've only seen um, within, uh, you know, the context of this client side scanning discussion. I've never seen this before um, as, a, as a thing. Um, so JJ Guevara says uh, they didn't think about it. Um, yeah, I don't know. In, in Germany, uh, it's, it's, it's Kinderpornografie. Uh, so uh, there's a somewhat it's an abbreviation that a lot of people use that's a bit too cute. Uh, it's called Kipo. So a lot of people call it Kipo. Um, yeah, CSS, that bothers, bothers me as well. Anyway, let's continue with this um, paper. Technically, CSS allows end-to-end -end encryption, but this is, mute, uh, this is mute if the message has already been scanned for targeted content. In reality, CSS is bulk intercept. 
albeit automated and distributed. As CSS gives government agencies access to private content, it must be treated like wiretapping. In jurisdictions where bulk intercept is prohibited, bulk CSS must be prohibited as well. Although CSS is represented as protecting the security of communications, the technology can be repurposed as a general mass surveillance tool. And I, I might add, it can be and will be. Um, that is me editorializing. The fact that CSS is at least partly done on the client device is not, as its proponents claim, a security feature. Rather, it is a source of weakness. As most user devices have vulnerabilities, the surveillance and control capabilities provided by CSS can potentially be abused by many adversaries, from hostile state actors. <coughs> the the uh, what, where is it? Wait, what what? Uh, the, you know, uh, wait, shit! I can't find my my soundboard button. Here it is. Okay, uh, let me redo this. Um, just I'll fix it in post. I'll cut it out. Um, where was I? As most user devices have vulnerabilities, the surveillance and control capabilities provided by CSS can potentially be abused by many adversaries from hostile state actors Goddamn Ruskies. through criminals to users' intimate partners. Moreover, the opacity of mobile operating system systems makes it difficult to verify that CSS policies target only material whose illegality is contested. The introduction of CSS would be much more privacy invasive than previous proposals to weaken encryption. Rather than reading the content of encrypted communications, CSS gives law enforcement the ability to remotely search not just communications, but information stored on user devices. And this is a good point um, that I hadn't considered actually when we talked about it the first time. The way this is implemented as a, you know, if we're, if we're talking... Um, operating system level on the phone the way it's actually implemented right you know in android ios whatever to do this to look into like we're talking like you're using an end-to-end -end encrypted app like whatsapp for example um to look at let's say you get an encrypted message you know the operating system delivers that encrypted message to whatsapp in its sandbox WhatsApp decrypts it and displays it on the screen. Another app by just some app developer couldn't look into that, right? If it could, there would be no point to end-to-end -end encryption. So you need operating system level privileges to look to do that, like to intercept, you know, the display between WhatsApp and it displaying it on screen, which you know the the OS does, for example. You could like patch in there, get the plain text. Now, if you can do that, you can. You know, if you have that permission, if you have a, like, you have an NSA Homeland Security service in iOS or Android that can do that, it has system level permissions. It can do anything. It can look in any app. It can, it can, it can track you in real time. It can get your position. It can get a location on the planet. It can get anything. Phone calls. You know, anything. So that's actually a good point they raise here. Um, <laughs> Astro C makes another good point a keylogger also allows you to have a full end-to-end -end yeah, it's basically that it's a keylogger let's say you use your desktop computer and you're using an end-to-end -end encrypted software uh, to talk to somebody if there's a keylogger in your keyboard they can see what you type and the, the, the same way this would probably be implemented in an op Android or iOS or whatever mobile operating system, right? It will patch into where stuff gets shown on the screen and when you type on the keyboard, when you type the actual message, right? Before it gets handed to the app, when the app encrypts it. So it's kind of the same thing. It is basically a keylogger, um, except it's worse than a keylogger because as they point out, not only can it see what you type, you know, the photos you upload, anything, it can, it can see anything. Anything that the, your phone operating system knows, this thing will know. And the only the only assurance that they're not doing that is uh, the, our word, uh, the the word from I don't know intelligence agencies, right? The same people that said they weren't reading our all of the internet traffic and sucking that in right now to hard disks before Snowden came along. Anyway, back to the paper. I'm almost through the intro here. 
I'm introducing this powerful scanning technology on all users' devices without fully understanding its vulnerabilities and thinking through the technical and policy consequences would be an extremely dangerous societal experiment. Given recent experience in multiple countries of hostile state interference in elections and referenda, it should be a national security priority to resist attempts to spy on and influence law-abiding citizens. CSS makes law-abiding citizens more vulnerable with their personal devices searchable on an industrial scale. Plainly put, it is a dangerous technology. Even if deployed initially to scan for child sex abuse material, content that is clearly illegal, there would be enormous pressure to expand its scope. We would then be hard-pressed to find any way to resist its expansion or to control abuse of the system. And, you know, these guys said, yeah, I mean, we know this because it happened before with other technology. That's all, always, it always happens like this. The ability of citizens to freely use digital devices, to create and store content, and to communicate with others depends strongly on our ability to feel safe in doing so. The introduction of scanning on our personal devices, devices that keep information from to-do notes to text and photos from loved ones, tears at the heart of privacy of individual citizens. Such bulk surveillance can result in, significant ch chilling of, in a significant chilling effect on freedom of speech and indeed on democracy itself. And that's, I think, putting it mildly. Um, I like this introduction. I think they summarize all of the stuff they go into. If you want, of course, I have a link to the paper in the show notes on Private Citizen Press. If you want the details, you can read the paper there. It's, it's very well written. It's, uh, I mean, it's a research paper, but you, you know, it's, it's, it's almost everyday language. I think everybody, everybody who can understand this show will be able to understand this paper. And I, you know, if you, if you interested in this topic i urge you to read the full version i'm going to go into some um more details in a bit but um it just might be worth reading that um i like the point they make at the end and this is a very this is very concise and very well thought through um we're in a society for better or worse this is nothing we can change right we can we can we can say all oh, phones are bad uh, the young people they're all phone zombies um actually I uh, watched the latest Bond movie last night and there was a trailer for the Ma Matrix, the new Matrix movie. Uh, there's an excellent scene where Keanu Reeves, as in, you know, uh, new Keanu, like not all old school Matrix, like John Wick Keanu with the long hair and the beard, stands in, a, uh, an, an, in an elevator surrounded by people looking at their phones and he just looks at the, <laughs> at the ceiling. <laughs> it's, uh, it's such a good scene. It's, it's so good. Um so, yes, I mean, that's the world we live in, for better or for worse. We will not be changing this. Um, and in such a world, it behooves a state, a democratic state, that is set up, you know, to enforce the rule of law, to protect its citizens. I mean, that's what a state is supposed to do. Um, the extent is debatable. You know, I have issues with that sometimes. We talked about, you know, SARS-CoV-2, the pandemic, um, and how far the states went to, quote, protect their citizens. But especially in this climate now, we all assume, or the society at large in, in pretty much any country you're probably in, uh, certainly Germany, the UK, uh, the US, society assumes, demands the press... And to some extent, also private citizens demand to be protected by the state. And in a, in a, in a world, it's just like a, you know, like that one trailer guy, isn't he? Isn't he dead now? But, you know, but remember the in a world, uh, trailer guy, like movie trailer guy, um, in a world where our all of our lives are digitally on our phones in our pockets, um, it behooves the state to protect that. That is, you know, if if it's the state's mandate to protect law-abiding citizens, then the state needs to protect the privacy there. I feel because it 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 historically did so with um, with your privacy in other um, areas. Right, so I, I'm in Germany, I've lived in the UK, it's the same in the US, uh, it's the same in many, many, many countries. Um, it is assumed, enshrined in a constitution or in other basic laws, that, for example, 
the state cannot just barge into your home and, and just go start going through your papers, right? It is not accepted by society for just the police coming around going, hello, uh, please uh, stand against this wall while we search your desk for two hours. Um, which is what this is, except it's your digital desk in your pocket. So people don't realize that. They don't realize that that is what these people that 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 advocate for that's what they want they want and i'm using this as somebody who studied history german history and i'm not what i'm saying i'm just not this is not hyperbole it is somewhat of a gestapo state right in germany that was what was so feared about nazi germany the gestapo just coming around just going hey we we need to look at your stuff for the better of the of society. Um, back then, the argument was um, there are evil, you know, spies and influences that want to destroy Germany and and hurt the German people, and they have corrupted Germans. So we need to like search your stuff. It's for your own good and for the betterment of society. That's basically what this is, except they're now saying, well, it's evil child pornography. Um, and it's the EU saying, we need a law. Or the, you know, the United States Congress saying, we need a law for this. But I think this is what you need to, you know, understand. Um, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't advise putting it that way when you're talking to normal people because your your relatives will think you're crazy i mean not me people just well they probably think i'm crazy there but they just assume i'm just coming in with the nazi reference uh every 10 minutes but i mean in this case i think it, it it's, it's very justified i mean you could also go the stasi route, route that's the same way uh, i listened to a speech by some philosophers some german like thinker the other the other day um where he was, I think he's a, somewhat of a leftist uh, guy, but he was basically advocate. He was the, his idea was this: um, in the Cold War, when the West fought the Soviet Union in Germany, we said we can't be like the DDR, right? The DDR, the German Democratic Republic, Deutsche Demokratische Republik. We can't be like those guys. We can't be like the evil Aussies. Um, they are bad. They are spying on each other. They have built a society where the state is spying on everybody. And this guy was arguing that basically that's we built that in the West. You know, we won the Cold War and in I don't know, somehow in winning, I didn't I didn't he didn't really put a a theory forth why, but like he was he was basically saying what has happened is that for better or for worse, we built the same um a very similar system, except for us, it's not a, the socialist state doing it, it's the capitalist companies. Um, and I think he kind of has a point. And up until a while ago, I would have said, yeah, but it's like companies, it's not organized by the state. But we see again and again, we see instances of the state using private companies. And, and I mean, this is, this is being put into devices by companies like Apple because legislators from the state, i.e. in the European Union or in, in, you know, in Congress, want this. They want this. So it, it is the state. It's the state doing it. It's just using private companies because that's the way how we do stuff now. Um, yeah, so I, I, I thought very, very enlightening how they put this. Um, I found it very interesting that a bit into this paper, um, the authors make a point that I would summarize as follows. I think they would probably wouldn't, but I would. Uh, we often talked about the culture wars here, and like you know the 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 the, the vi widening divide between you know progressive and conservative or left or right or whatever you want to call this. And um, but um, so they basically make the point that this client side scanning might might be put in and might later be used not to 
what is now advertised as, yeah, you know, you know, invade some people's privacy to stop terrorists and organize crime and stuff like that, but actually to censor speech. Um, and they take this from a development that has happened and that we've known and I've reported on for for you know since the show exists, but that's been been there longer. So I'm, I want to I want to read out these three par paragraphs that are further into the paper because I also found them very interesting. So the authors authors say. Many online service providers that allow users to send arbitrary content to other users already perform periodic scanning, you know, because of laws, uh, periodic scanning to detect uh, that we, you know, the state passed, uh, several states passed, uh, <clears throat> are already perform periodic scanning to detect objectionable material and in some cases report it to authorities. Targeted content might include spam, hate speech, animal cruelty, and for some providers, nudity. Local laws may mandate reporting or removal. For example, France and Germany have for years required to take down of Nazi material and the EU has mandated that this be ex extended to terrorist material generally in all member states. And, you know, this is already a lot more political what, what terrorist material is, right? We talked about that when Facebook is going on about, you know, your friends are probably terrorists, like what that means. Um, in the US, providers are required to report content flagged as CSAM, there's that word, Uh, or that uh, abbreviation, to a clearinghouse operated by the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, and CMEC, while in the UK a similar function is provided by the Internet Watch Foundation, IWF. Historically, content scanning mechanisms have been implemented on provider-operated servers. Since the mid-2000s, scanning has helped drive research in machine learning technologies, which were first adopted in spam filters from 2003. However, scanning is expensive, particularly for complex content such as video. Large machine learning models that run on racks of servers are typically complemented by thousands of human moderators who inspect and classify suspect content. We talked about all of this on the show. These people not only resolve difficult edge cases, but also help train the machine learning models and enable them to adapt to new types of abuse. One incentive for firms to adopt end-to-end -end encryption may be the costs of content moderation. Facebook alone has 15,000 human moderators and critics have suggested that their number should double. Actually, I have a typo here and I'm just going to quickly um, fix that. Where is it? Here we go. All right. Um, why didn't that do that? All right, uh, come on, rebuild my show notes. I'm doing, obviously, I'm, you know, the show notes are not live on the internet as I do this. Um, when you're listening to this, there will be at private system not press. Um, Facebook alone has 15,000 human moderators and critics have suggested that their number should double. The burden of this process is much reduced by end-to-end -end encryption as the messaging servers no longer have access to content. Some moderation is still done based on user complaints and the analysis of metadata. However, some governments have responded with pressure to re-implement scanning on user devices. So they make several interesting points here. First of all, the scanning for nudity and stuff that we talked about, but like... An interesting point that I hadn't thought about personally is that, you know, of course, if, for example, Facebook implements enter encryption for private messages, they can't read those and they can't scan those, so they can't, require, can't be required by law, so they actually save money, <laughs> which is kind of, uh, yeah, interesting. Um, but as the authors say here, governments are now saying they want already, they want client-side scanning for this stuff, right? So they're like, okay... Uh, there's too much hate speech on the internet. We talked about that stance. There's too much hate. Too much hate. Uh, so we need to scan everything. Uh, we need to scan all social networks. And then they go, oh shit, but like people are end-to-end -end encrypting now. We can't look into that. And now the next move is, of course, to do that with client-side scanning, which means we're not even there yet. And these guys, I don't think they, I mean, they say it kind of veiled I think they want to be careful not to uh, anger certain, you know, uh, progressive elements who would be on their side, generally, um, by saying, "Look, this next, 
Like, you know all these people who like to scan the internet for stuff that you say, which might be hate speech or whatever? This is what, what this is going to be used ne for next. For next. I mean, I, I, that, was, that was clear to me. Um, I think I said something like this when I talked about this on the show earlier, but it's nice to have, you know, Ronald Rivest and, and, and uh, uh, Whitfield Diffie and, you know, Bruce Schneier say the same thing. Because when I say it, it's Fab the crazy conspiracy theorist, which I think people behind my back probably call me that, you know, but it's harder to dismiss something like this when actual hardcore crypto privacy security people say that. It's harder to dismiss Bruce, Bruce Schneier saying that. Um, and I like the point also, they made this point earlier that, of course, it's a wiretap. This is like a wiretap, so it should be treated like wiretap, right? So there should be a warrant. There should be the same high um, level of of like oversight by parliament or whatever, or you know, by judge that that is there for wiretapping. And they also make a good point in that when you're scanning on the server for whatever terrorism or child porn or maybe just hate speech in air quotes whatever that means currently, you know, f for your political, you know, if you're in Russia, hate speech means something very different than in China, than in Germany, than in the US. Um, but whatever they're scanning for, when they're scanning stuff on a server of a social network, that is not assumed to be private. At least it didn't used to be. I mean, the one reason I like Twitter and I don't like Facebook is that Twitter started with everything is public and Facebook started where everything's private. So there's still an assumption in Facebook, and there's all these groups that you can't look into, that it's somewhat private, which is dumb. Because, of course, it's a, you know, something could go wrong, you push the wrong button. With Twitter, you know, if you tweet it, it's public and it can be quoted in news articles. And I like that. I like the ground rules there. Uh, but generally, a social network is something that is, people wouldn't, like, I think most people, even if they post something in a somewhat private Facebook group with like probably 500 members or whatever, they wouldn't assume that to be private. Like the stuff they post is not like exactly private. It's not public. You know, if it's not a tweet, they probably wouldn't, con some people don't consider tweets public, which is weird. Not consider tweets public, which is weird. But like, you know, they, you know, they wouldn't consider that quite public. So it's a different uh, difference of scanning that and scanning stuff directly on your device because that is as public as it gets. Um, I would even argue um, that um, the way what they're scanning on your phone, your to-do list, all this is private thoughts. It's, it's as close to actually p spying on people's actual thoughts as you can get. Um, if we're just talking messages... That is something that traditionally would be voiced, right? So if I write my wife in an end-to-end -end encrypted thing, it might be private, but at least it's something I would voice to her, where something I put in a to-do list or something like that uh, might actually be private thoughts. Um, so it's, 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 it's very, very invasive. It's more invasive than anything else we've seen so far, I think. Um, and as the authors also say, because this privacy violation is performed at the scale of entire populations, it is bulk surveillance technology. And I think you can't really argue with that. Um, interesting, they also make, make the point that despite all that and despite all the access they have when, you know, people, they, whoever institutes the system has, um, it might actually be less useful. Um, because, you know, there are attacks. We know there are attacks against these kind of systems. Um, you know, you can create false negatives. You can uh, trick the system into flagging all kinds of stuff that's harmless. You know, you can flood it with false positives. Um, and as you also say, such attacks are not new. They've been carried out for years on server-side scanners, such as spam filters. But a move to client-side scanning brings one telling advantage to the adversaries. The adversary can use its access uh, to the device to reverse engineer the mechanism. As an example, it took barely two weeks for the community to reverse engineer the version of Apple's neural hash algorithm already present in iOS 14, which led to immediate breaches. 
Apple has devoted a major engineering effort uh, and employed top technical talent in an attempt to build a safe and secure CSS system, but it has still not produced a secure and trustworthy design. And this is Apple we're talking about. If they can't do it, nobody can. Probably, I think that's what they are probably saying here. Um, it is kind of, you know, it's like the... Wasn't that also called CSS, like the DVD encryption? It's kind of like that. If you give people the the thing, they can figure it out, right? Um, because it's all done like it's like a disk you put in your system. Um, whereas a system that has like a server-side component, like let's say, you know, Netflix encrypting their streams, um, so, you know, you can't, I mean, you can rip them, you can rip the audio and you can rip them frame for frame, like basically ha hardware wise, but like, you know, that actually encourages a lot harder to break than if you, if they actually ship you all of the components that do the encrypting or that do the decrypting. It's like, it's like relatively easy for people who know what they're doing to reverse engineer that. Um, so interestingly, they end this paper with, which, Basic, well, they say literally CSS cannot be deployed safely. Um, they say CSS has been prom promoted as a magical technology fix, a magical technology fix for the conflict between the privacy of people's data and communications and the desire by intelligence law enforcement agencies for more comprehensive investigative tools. A thorough analysis shows that the promise of CSS solutions is an illusion. Technically moving content scanning from the cloud to the client empowers a range of adversaries. It is likely to reduce the eff efficacy of scanning while increasing the likelihood of a variety of attacks. Economics cannot be ignored. And this is also an important point that I, I hadn't realized, but it's a good, good they put it well. Uh, one way that, doma demo one way that demo democratic societies protect their citizens against the ever-present danger of government intrusion is by making search expensive. In the U.S. and it's the same Germany. Uh, in the U.S., there are several mechanisms that do this, including the onerous process of applying for a wiretap warrant, which for criminal cases must be essentially a, quote, last resort investigative tool. And imposition of requirements such as minimization, uh, law enforcement not listening or taping if communication does not pertain to criminal activity. These raise the cost of wiretapping. Um so actually interesting, I always had like the the wiretap idea from like uh, TV shows in the US where they just write, you know, they just, I mean, they listen in, but they just like write all the phone calls to a hard drive or whatever, and then they scan them or whatever, and then somebody comes in with the report based on that. And uh, actually reading a um, book by Michael Connolly, who writes the Bosch novels, and is very uh, well versed in like law enforcement, especially in the LAPD. Uh, he used to be a crime uh, reporter and he used to be actually uh, basically embedded with the LAPD for a while. And he knows a lot of detectives there and talks to them. So he knows how it's actually done. And he actually describes it in a book where, that, where they're hunting a serial killer, where like the FBI and the LAPD hunting a serial killer. And basically what they have to do is they have to get agents. So there's this, in LA, there's this office it's actually a third-party company because, of course, it is these days. Um, where, like, if you get a warrant, um, they have all the equipment there to do a wiretap, like on a mobile phone or like a landline, doesn't matter. Um, but the LAPD or the FBI or whatever, in this case, they're like uh, a task force, so they send like FBI guys and LAPD guys. Anyway, they have to send agents or like detectives to actually physically sit there and 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 listen to the calls um, because they, I mean, they can record them. But the agents need to decide when they when they just you know bugged somebody's phone, is he just talking like you know it's like a serial killer or whatever it's a mafia it's like a Rico case or whatever is he actually just talking to some random guy or like his girlfriend or like a garage or does it actually have something to do with a crime in which case they can record it um, but all the other stuff they are not allowed to record which I found very interesting I didn't know that it worked that way. Um, and I, I looked it up afterwards and it seems to be that's the way they do it, um, which I thought was very interesting that they actually, he talks a lot about like they, they don't have enough people and, you know, they have like a task force and they have like 15 people and they, 
Bosch like or is like superior needs to decide like who who are we putting on like actual surveillance like old school in cars or like in an apartment across the street right who's doing like um a field, like other field work uh who is like they have a tip line on the phone like who's who's going through the tips uh and who's actually going to be going to be going to that downtown office building where like this company is that was uh, very interesting anyway let's continue with this paper Uh, by contrast, a general CSS system makes all materials cheaply accessible to government agents. It eliminates the requirement of physical access to the devices. It can be configured to scan any file on any device. I.e., it's easier than than a keylogger, whereas like you know the NSA or CIA needs to break into your apartment and actually put a keylogger there. Um, it is unclear whether CSS systems can be de deployed in a secure manner such that invasions of privacy can be considered proportional. And they talk about this early in the paper, you know, that's a European, uh, very European notion uh, where uh, when you, when we're talking privacy laws uh, and, and wiretaps and stuff like that, um, they, uh, in the US, generally, they there's a law, right, about this. And the law, the law... Um, kind of lays the ground rules when you can do it and you know you have to get a warrant from a judge or whatever and but if it's within the law you can do it in the eu we have an additional uh, level on top of that which is often like just oversight after the fact but it is there um where not only does it have to comply to the law but it has to be proportional right so um when i talked about the cyber bunker case um you know and then did an episode on uh when I was down in Trier, um, they, uh, that's a very important aspect. Like the, the prosecutor has to show that, you know, they wiretapped the internet connection going into this data center. And they took pains to explain that there was no legal content listed, uh, hosted in this whole data center. Or, you know, otherwise they would have said probably just a, just a little bit. But they did that because the judge might go, hey, If you're wiretapping an internet connection to a data center and like only at say 10% of the stuff's actually that you're listening to is actually criminal activity and the other stuff is just like, you know, stuff from law-abiding citizens, then the judge could go out and could say, this is not proportional. What you're doing is not proportional to what you're trying to do, um, i.e. you're within the law maybe, but like the letter of the law, but not the spirit of the law, right? You're You're hurting a lot more people than you're helping And then, then the judge can throw out um, the evidence, for example. And that's um, interesting in this CSS example, especially because I talked about EncroChat. When I talked about CSS first, that's how they broke the EncroChat system, right? So a alleged, allegedly, or we know pretty much now, a, a uh, encrypted phone network only used by criminals. So it was designed by uh, organized crime people for organized crime people. Um, but still... Um, you know, I think uh, the Dutch police was 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 very uh, uh, they they spearheaded the 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 operation whatever and you know, lots of Dutch law and stuff. But they also, of course, gave that stuff to German investigators. And then there were German court cases. And in the first German court case, the judge threw out the the evidence collected from these encrypted phones because he said you're spying on everything they do over these phones. Uh, for like in this case, okay, you're trying to prove this. It's not proportional. You you can't do that. Um, you know, basically uh, saying like, okay, if there's a ma ma mafia figure and you bug their their house and you you're recording everything, you re like you're recording his whole family, and maybe it's just like the, the one guy. You know, it's like a Tony Soprano situation, and he's running a mafia organization, but like his kids, his wife, they're like. Oh, Sopranos is probably a bad example because his wife was involved with it. But like, you know, and his kids later on as well. But like, if you're in a situation like that where you're like, you know, it's not proportional. Um, and that's that's a very important uh, factor in law that we have in Europe that I think lots of American um, even like journalists and people who observe this and write about this stuff don't understand because they don't really understand how that it's a different, you know, it's a different understanding of, of law. Um, 
So anyway, they bring that up, uh, continuing here in the paper. Uh, more importantly, it is unlikely that any technical measure can resolve this dilemma, which also, uh, which is also working at scale. If any vendors claim that they have a workable product, so something you know that that scans everything, but is like still proportional, right? Uh, if any vendor claims they have a workable product, it must be subjected to rigorous public review and testing before a government even considers mandating its use. This brings us to the decision point. The proposal to preemptively scan all users' devices for targeted content is far more insidious than earlier proposals for key escrow and exceptional access. Instead of having targeted cap and key escrow, we thought was really bad. Uh, instead of having targeted capabilities such as to wiretap communications with the warrant and to perform forensics on seized devices, the agency's direction of travel, and this is important, and this is something I've noticed as well, the agency's direction of travel is the bulk scanning of everyone's private data all the time without war warrant or suspicion. I.e., they haven't learned from Snowden, right? They were like, I mean, before Snowden, somebody working in the BND or the NSA or GCHQ could have said, in good faith, uh, you know, the public doesn't really know what we're doing. But I think they'd, be, they'd, be, they'd agree with us because this is for a good cause. Snowden came out, this was reported, um, and we realized, the world realized, these people realized that the majority of private citizens, law abiding citizens, do actually not agree with this. And they don't think it's proportional and they don't think it's it's good. So but they're still at it. They're still they still want to see everything without suspicion, without anything. And now they know that, you know, we the public, we might not have enough power because of how our democracies work, you know, to, to kick out the intelligence services. And you know, some of us or Maybe the majority would, would still think that intelligence services are important. I, I'm not so sure about that, by the way. But, you know, we need them. But um, but I think they now know that this bulk scanning without warrant and suspicion is not something the public wants, the majority of the public. And they're still at it. As the writers of this paper would say that crosses a red line it is prudent prudent to deploy extremely powerful surveillance is it no is it prudent to deploy extremely powerful surveillance technology that could easily be extended to undermine basic freedoms where css to be widely deployed the only protection would lie in the law that is a very dangerous place to be we must bear in mind the 2006 EU Directive on Data Retention, later struck down by the European Court of Justice, and the interpretations of the USA Patriot Act that permitted bulk collection of domestic and call detail records. And the public reaction to it, I is note. In a world, in a world, where our personal information lies in bits carried on powerful communication storage devices in our pockets, both technology and laws must be designed to protect our privacy and security, not intrude upon it. Robust protection requires technology and law to complement each other. Client-side scanning would gravely undermine this, making us all less safe and less secure. That's how this paper ends, and there's really not, there's nothing more I can say about this. Um, one of the reasons, I, 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 you probably know this, you, you've probably been of the same opinion, um, I talked about all of this basically, well, not all of it, as, as you can see, some points I never thought about, but the general gist, I think, we probably everybody listened to the show was in agreement. At least nobody wrote to me, and I always want comments, I haven't said this on the show yet, Private Citizen or Press, up the top, contact link, all the details on there, get in touch if you don't agree. You can get in touch if you agree as well, if you have some, you know, get in touch anyway. But, you know, I value constructive criticism where you go like i don't agree and here's why uh you know maybe you say ch child porn is, is so egregious and you know we can have that argument i don't expect you to come around me to come around and agree with you you know but i will probably read out your point if it's well argued on the show because i like counterpoints and i think it's important because i don't want to preach here right but i think as far as i know everybody who listens to the show is in agreement with me on that um but I still 
found it important because this is a very well written paper and has some very good material and as you can see just very eloquently worded and I think it just gives us more firepower right if we are the ones the nerds the forefront of the the upcoming revolution or whatever it is um you know if we're the ones um who need to um argue this then then this paper is a good gives us gives us some good firepower um gives us some good arguments by some some very intelligent people and by some respected people so i thought that was important and um yeah i can only say please um Please let me know. Um, if you don't agree, if you have counterpoints, if you have any other additional points, please write in. Um, there are many ways to contact me. Private Citizen Press contact link up the top. There's an episode link and a contact link. The episode link gets you to all the episodes of the show. Nice list uh, chronologically from the newest to the oldest. Um, and the contact form is all uh, the contact page has all the details including a whistleblower form that's encrypted and you can and there's a link to a blog post that explains how you might use that um and not leave any trace and i've, I've had some uh truly anonymous feedback in the past and it's always uh it's always cool so kind of cool to get that um anyway let's um let's speaking of feedback let's get into the section where i talk about feedback i have gotten in the past <laughs> So as I've te teased earlier, this is a little uh, somewhat of a, well, it's a discussion on the COVID-19 SARS-CoV-2 thing that I keep harping on about on the show because it bugs me so much. And there was a little mini discussion on our Discord channel, um, which I think it's also, is it linked on the contact page? If it's not, I'm, I'm embarrassing myself here. So I'm going to just click private citizen private of press, go, on the, go to the contact link. Yes, it has a link to the Discord server. Um, so you can go there as well if you want to, and you can discuss with other producers of the show, as we have here. So Barry Williams, a long-time producer, um, long-time supporter. Wow, my microphone. Wow, listen to that. I think I need some WD-40, my microphone boom. I'm sorry about that. Uh, long-time uh, producer Barry Williams said the following. Uh, While I 100% agree... That people should use correct language. At what point does the term SARS-CoV-2 cause more misunderstandings than COVID-19? I'm not sure about German, but English is a fluid language and common use dictates definition. Certain dictionary dictionaries have added a sub-definition to literally to include the exact opposite, as in, as in common use, I literally broke my leg off. This podcast is the only time I've heard the term SARS-CoV-2, and I was happy for the education. However, when I go to use this term correctly in place of COVID-19, it feels it may cause confusion. Um, I find it extremely disheartening that this podcast is the only place where you have SARS-CoV-2. So in case people haven't been there for this whole saga, let me just quickly explain. All right. Um, I used to, I like to use um, correct and specific terminology whenever I can. This is because I went to university, <laughs> some old, very old school subjects, um, politics, history, with you know professors who are very eloquent and and very literally, uh, literally or maybe also, but mostly liter literary minded. And you know, if you if you if you study politics and and history, even if you like me, you drop out and you never get a degree. Um, afterwards, you consider yourself somewhat of a intellectual. That's kind of what, you know. And then I also studied English, which is, uh, you know, I studied the language. So I studied um, uh, linguistics um, somewhat until I dropped out. <laughs> but, you know, I did it took a lot of it. And, you know, why it's true. I mean, Barry has a point here. Language is fluid. Um, I feel like lots of people who, don't, who haven't studied linguistics use this as an excuse. You know, whenever you go, please use the direct, the correct terminology, they go... Yeah, but language is fluid and blah, 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 blah. And um, that is true, but it's it's usually not that fluid. And I feel it shouldn't be used as, as an excuse for for stupidity, i.e. the literally uh, thing where it doesn't mean literally. Um, that is stupidity. I mean, it, it is use. And I mean, I do it sometimes. Um, sometimes I do it ironically. 
uh, but I do it. And I think it's okay for a dictionary to point that out because a dictionary needs to teach somebody who doesn't know this. Let's say I'm, I'm German and I don't know what literally means. It is helpful for me to know that people use it in the ex exact opposite um, uh, way than it's, uh, of its actual definition. Uh, but I think it should also point out that that is... Um, I don't know, correct is a little bit... Like, I, I understand where people are coming from. You know, people sometimes tell me, uh, like, you know, and this goes back to Linux Outlaws days when I did a Linux podcast called Linux Outlaws and I was annoying my co-host Dan with stuff like this. Um, people point out that that's kind of like being a bit like a grammar Nazi. Um, but I feel it's somewhat different with grammar uh, because grammar itself d usually doesn't impede understanding. Uh, Eng English is a good example that the only way, the only, you know, I'm not good at grammar, uh, which might surprise you because I'm a professional journalist. Um, but, you know, I've, I've taught myself to avoid the mistakes I traditionally make. Uh, but I am, I can't remember grammar rules. I just play it by heart. And most of the time it works. I can do it. So it's kind of a skill of mine. But um, English is a very good language to understand that grammar basically doesn't matter. Because if you're learning English, um, you can basically form a German sentence. That is, you can tr you can literally literally <laughs> take a German a sentence in the German language and translate every word word into English, and 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 say that to an Englishman, and they will understand what you mean. It will be grammatically completely wrong, and it will you know words will be in places where they're not in English, um, where they're supposed where not where they're supposed to be, but you will understand. Um, there are some other languages where that doesn't work, like Chinese. Uh, it see, doesn't seem to work that well in France. Uh, in French, I don't know if the the, Fr the French are just more picky, um, and it won't work in German because German is very intricate. Uh, so you can, um, it's more intricate than English in that way. Like in, no, oh, it's it's not more intricate. Like for example, English does a lot of its intricacies through having many different words basically the same thing and they will in 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 linguistics you call this register right you can use uh the word uh so what do, what do we have for dinner and you can say sheep or you can say mutton it's both correct but it's a very different register i.e it it might it might explain what station it might show other people what station what what societal level you come from it might show disdain for something or it might show that you're sophisticated right it shows all of that in german we don't do that so much with the words we use we d we do that with how we form the sentence um so we can say the exact same thing and just with basically the same words but we change this, the, the order of the words around which has a lots of nuances so you can't just take an english sentence and just translate every word into german and say that to a german and they might understand you um, but there will probably be some abstraction involved because it will destroy some int in intricacies of what you're trying to say. Um, so grammar is not that, I feel, is not at, as bad as I'm actually, yes, I'm a term Nazi. I think, um, I mean, there's also, almost like registers, there's also different levels of a discussion you're having, right? When I'm talking with my friends and I'm in the pub, Right, I'll 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 let COVID nineteen slip if they actually meant meant SARS CoV two. But here, you know, the, I'm a journalist, so my job is words. My job is to express a message as clearly to as many people as possible, so that they can understand it. So I need to think about what words I'm using. And I think any every anybody who's in a job like is a journalist, is a teacher, is a scientist, scientist. Um, is any kind of educator or um, broadcast to a lot of people, right? Even a Twitch streamer, let's say, I think needs to be conscious of their words and they need to be careful what they're trying to say. And I think in those cases, being precise is very important, especially when you're talking about very, very clear nuances uh, or very, no, very nuanced things that are important. And for some reason... Most people listen to my podcast who understand this with technical matters. 
right? They will go mad if I use a programming term wrong. But if we're talking like a medical term, because that you know there may be programmers or techie people, they don't care. But just try to put that on your on your level, right? So every profession has very specific terms, and they're very important in certain aspects. And as a journalist, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to learn that when I'm writing about something from that profession, I'm trying to learn what they're saying and use the correct words in a way that is still understandable to the general public. And that is a hard, that's one of the hardest things about being a journalist. Um, but when it's done well, it's a, it's a, it's, 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 it's a sign of, it's, a, it's, it's, it's beauty to behold. Um, and that's what I aspire to. Um, anyway, um, I should probably explain, I, it just occurred to me, I, want to, I think I wanted to explain this initially, but I should, for anybody who wasn't around for this discussion, I should quickly explain the difference between SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. So there are medical terms. SARS-CoV-2 is the it's is what the virus is called right it's a it's a version of sars which is oh what's sars mean again i know mers is middle eastern respiratory syndrome sars is south asian Re no severe acute respiratory syndrome so that you know that was the first first virus um so um sars cov2 originally used to be called SARS NCOV 2019, I think. So they knew it was like kind of a SARS from a very early outbreak in China. They knew it was a SARS like thing. NCOV was like new coronavirus. And 2019 was the year it, it was first described, right? Um, or maybe it was even called NCOV 2019. Was it? Was it? Wait, I'm going to have to look this up. Uh, so it was, you know, they knew it was a coronavirus because that's kind of obvious. Um, so that's that's where the NCOV, yeah. No, it, actually, the original name, um, just, I just quickly had to look this up. Uh, the original name was 2019 NCOV. So 2019 novel coronavirus. Then they figured out it was SARS-related. So it was like there was SARS and there was MERS, and this was the second SARS. So they called it SARS-CoV-2, SARS-Coronavirus-2. You know, SARS and MERS also being coronaviruses. Um, that's the virus. That's a term for the virus. COVID-19 is the term for the disease. More specifically, there's like these terms in medical science. For a, Generally, it's a collection of symptoms. COVID-19 is a collection of symptoms. COVID Getting COVID-19 means you're really, really sick. COVID-19 means you have beyond like normal flu symptoms. Like it's, you have that, um, well, one of the symptoms is that specific cough, but you can just have that cough and nothing else. COVID-19 means you are, uh, you know, you have lung problems or everything that, that's connected to that disease. Basically, in layman's terms, COVID-19 means you got the virus, you developed symptoms, you got really, really sick. And that's the in important um, distinction between this virus because um, you can get the virus, you're SARS-CoV-2 positive, doesn't mean you get COVID. Only a small percentage of people who have the virus actually get COVID, i.e. get really sick and possibly have to go to the ICU or even, you know, have to be put on a breathalyzer or like a, um, you know, that um, whatever that, what's that, what's that heart thing, other machine. Anyway, forgot for, forgot the specific name of it. Uh, anyway, um, and that's a very important distinction um, because if it was the same, um, then you know, if if actually being infected with the virus meant you got COVID, we would all be sick, very sick, and and that is specifically not the case, and that's why the virus spreads that much because people get it. Um, and I mean, this is this is this is clear and now scientifically very well demonstrated. People get it; they barely realize it, or they barely have symptoms. Some people have no symptoms, and they spread it during that time. But right? the reason 
Ebola never spread through the whole planet is you fucking get Ebola and you fucking get the symptoms, right? There's like one in that one nurse, for example, they got the first antibodies where they made the monoclonal anti antibodies. Like there, there are like patient zero carriers who don't get sick, but they're very, very, very rare. It's like one in a thousand or even less or much less. But anyway, so basically everybody gets sick, gets sick very quickly. That means you can isolate them. Right, they start bleeding from their eyes. You know, they got a fucking Ebola, and you put them on a, on a, in a, in a, in a, you know, isolation ward, and that's why it's very deadly. But it's also, it can be contained, quite well, not quite easily, but much more easily than SARS-CoV-2, where you have people who might be infectious for a week and they don't have any symptoms beyond like blowing their nose. So you don't know, do they have a common cold or do they have this virus? Um, so there's, it's a very specific, uh, I know the terms are cumbersome, but like, it's a, it's a, it's a big difference, right? So you can, you're an uninfected person, you get infected with SARS-CoV-2, now we, now you're infected, that doesn't mean you're sick, you just have the virus in your system, right? For example, I'm vaccinated, right? I, I got I got the vaccine. So I might be infected with SARS-CoV-2. I might have it in my body, but because I'm vaccinated or people who were sick and are now uh, immune, um, the immune system fights it to a point where I, I might not even spread it, but I have it in my system. I'm positive. I'm SARS-CoV-2 positive, right? If they do, do a PCR test, I'm probably going to show up as positive, but I'm not infecting anybody and I'm probably not being sick because, you know, I, I'm, I'm vaccinated. So... You're, you're uninfected, you get infected, then you have, have SARS-CoV-2 in your system. Then you might develop symptoms, minor cold symptoms might get worse. And if you get really bad symptoms and you're laid out flat for two weeks or whatever, then you get COVID-19. If you get the specific collect collection of, co uh, of, of symptoms for COVID-19, you have COVID-19. And why am I harping on about this? Because the press now for over a year it's been going on, oh, uh, COVID-19 test. You can't, like, okay, you can test for COVID-19. You, you check, does the patient have specific symptoms? If you do a PCR, if you do an antigen test, uh, if you, you know, take that titer or whatever, you're testing for SARS-CoV-2 or its antibodies, not for COVID-19, right? Do they have pneumonia or something? That would be like a test for COVID-19. It's very different. It's it annoys me that vaccine companies who are you know produce medical drugs and vaccines professionally put on their vaccine it's a COVID nineteen vaccine that is wrong scientifically wrong it's categorically wrong no it's a SARS CoV two vaccine you can't vaccinate against a collection of symptoms that is the Basically, they're, they're, when you confuse those two, you confuse cause and effect. The cause is the virus, the effect is the symptoms. SARS-CoV-2 is the cause, COVID-19 is the effect. Um, so when you do a show like me, a podcast, and you're trying to explain, like in the beginning, I tried to explain, you know, what this virus is, how it works, because you need that as a basis when you go, okay, this is the measures the state is implementing and why do some of them work or maybe some don't, um, you need to be that specific. Like you can't mix these terms up. And one thing I want to point out uh, to Barry and to everybody else who's listening to that show, when I'm being nitpicky about this, I'm not nit being nitpicking to you. I understand if you're talking to your friends, use whatever term they understand. That's good communication. I'm being nitpicky with journalists, with scientists, with medical professionals, with companies, with PR people, people whose job it is to be specific. When you're a scientist and you're working on this shit, you can't mix those terms up, right? If you're first semester in university and you're writing a paper and you mix up two basic terms like that, you get fucking failed, right? There's a difference between, okay, if you're doing, uh, uh, you know, if you're doing history, right? Like I did. And uh, if you confuse uh, the Third Reich with the Weimar Republic, 
But it's completely clear by context what you mean on the, the rest of your paper. You still get fucking failed because you don't do that. You're a scientist. Your job is to be precise. That's the point. And I had thought that being a journalist means that as well. Yes, journalists must talk in a way or write in a way, whatever, you know, broadcast in a way that the public understands. But that doesn't mean... I mean, you can do that and you can still be correct. And that's what I'm doing. Like, if I write a, an article and some fucking editor somewhere changes SARS-CoV-2 to COVID-19, I'm going to go ballistic. And I have in the past. I will go, look, this is wrong. We don't put wrong things in the article. I don't care that it's like five characters shorter and you wanted to fit it in the headline you don't do that that is shitty journalism and um i would like to now read out the response that astro c had uh, in the discord chat to barry who wrote this um because he brings up another historic point that is interesting where this has happened anyway i wanted to point out barry uh you know talk to your talk to whatever i'm not picking or any other listener i'm not picking on you or like your um relatives or your friends or whoever said that i'm picking on journalists scientists teachers educators people whose job it is to be this precise and if they can't do that if a journalist can't do that if a journalist confuses sars cov 2 and covid 19 or they mix it up i don't know if they're confused i can't tr fucking trust them because if they don't know that that's like for the first two weeks german public broadcasting you know the the most trusted news source in the whole country um was talking about this virus and saying it's a DNA virus. It's not, obviously. It's an RNA virus. But they broadcast it to the world that they don't, or the whole country, that they don't fucking understand the difference between DNA and RNA. How can I trust somebody like that if they go on the news and they can't tell that difference, especially if it's so trivial that you go to the fucking Wikipedia site for the virus and the first sentence on there says it correctly. Right? I mean, it's not even, you don't even, as a journalist, here's, 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 a, here's, here's a secret. You don't even have to know it. You just have to copy it off whatever source you got it correctly. And you, you double check. You don't just write it's a DNA virus. You go on the internet, you go on Grandma Google, and you go like, SARS-CoV-2 DNA virus. And then Google says, did you mean RNA virus? Because it's an RNA virus. Right? So if you can't do that, if you can't if you can't take those twenty seconds, how can I trust you? And that's why I harp on about this. Anyway, Astral C responded to Barry and said, I think it's important to use the correct term. Is it the virus or the disease? Also every word has extra meaning behind it in a new speak way. It may be from propaganda or groupthink, but I still have the extra meaning. Pandemic! Comply wait, where's my oh my bullhorn? I haven't used that in a while. Where is it? pandemic comply or you're killing grandma versus a virus mutation close to SARS she makes a good point SARS-CoV-2 kind of tells you it's kind of like SARS and we didn't all die on at, with SARS so uh, it might get people thinking which we don't want well we we hear on this podcast but most 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 publications don't we talked about this in the past um, it is especially important when reporting on medical issues including treatments Uh, it is the same as when the media started to use HIV instead of AIDS. Not sure about the reason. California bullshit like remove the stigma. If using the correct name is not important. <laughs> This is a good point. It's somewhat um, a troublemaker, but it's good, I think. Uh, if using the correct name is not important, what's wrong with China virus or Wuhan disease? They still describe the same thing, but the extra meaning of uh, but has but have the extra meaning in air quotes of the true origin. Um, actually, like I like Wuhan disease because that was, uh, for some reason, that was politically very controversial. Whereas any other fucking virus disease outbreak is named after, the, like this, you know, especially all the virus, you know, all the all the, the really deadly ones. I mean, the Ebola virus, because Ebola is a river where the first outbreak was. Uh, the the related Marburg virus because it broke out in the fucking university in Mar Marburg. Right? Nobody's complaining. Oh, that gives the university a bad name. Well, it fucking broke out there first. Uh, you know, the Reston strain, because it fucking, they fucked it up in Reston. 
uh, was that Virginia, I think? Um, you know, they're all called after the, you know, the, the, the Red River virus that I got, actually got uh, vaccinated against when I went to Australia. But for some reason, you can't say Wuhan disease. I mean, we all knew it broke out in Wuhan first. Um, I think uh, when Astro C, he brings up the point of HIV and AIDS, which is a uh, historic or now historic uh, thing of the media doing the same thing, where HIV is the virus, human, uh, oh God, HIV? Why don't I know what HIV stands for? Shit. Uh, that is a human immunodeficiency virus and AIDS, uh, which I don't know what it stands for either right now. So for some, skip my brain. Um, H is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome, i.e. HIV being the virus, AIDS, AIDS is the, the resulting disease, the uh, collection of symptoms, which is why AIDS is the older term because, you know, the medical community realized that people were having these symptoms, but they didn't know how. And then some guy, or I think two guys, actually got a Nobel Prize in medicine for figuring out that, w that it was a virus. Uh, later then named HIV virus, you know, HIV. Um, and uh, yeah, one of the guys was, uh, funny, the guy, who, one of the guys who said, maybe COVID came from a lab. Well, COVID, I'm doing it wrong now as well. Maybe it's, maybe it's SARS-CoV-2. See, it's uh, this fucking influence propaganda. It works. Um, SARS-CoV-2 uh, came from a lab because it kind of looks to me that way. That was one that was the French scientist who got a Nobel Prize for uh, figuring out what HIV was. Um, but I think he confuses it because he says started to use HIV instead of AIDS. I think uh, they used AIDS even when they knew it was... A v oh, did they use HIV? Yeah, I think he's right because like AIDS was kind of a stigma, right? But I don't know why that happened. It might have... You know, I'm not even saying... I think Astral C is insinuating that this has a propaganda purpose, which I think it has sometimes. I think he's right, but generally I think it's just stupidity because journalists are lazy fuckers and they don't do that research that I like to do. Um, and they will just, somebody will start calling COVID and then everybody's like, oh, COVID is easier, let's just use that. And they just don't think. They just don't think. They just don't want to be correct, which is okay if you're in the fucking Discord for my podcast, but like if, you, if you're a journalist and you're writing you know, if you're working in the news business, you should could f fucking get your terms right. And this is HIV. This is why it was, it's so confusing. The media's fucked that up for decades that a lot of people don't know what the difference is. Right? Um, I mean, yes, it's, as we know, AIDS is always caused by HIV, but it's still different because with AIDS as well, or HIV, there are actually some people who have HIV who do not have AIDS, who do not develop the symptoms who are sometimes very dangerous because they infect a lot of people, sometimes on purpose, for some weird fucked up reason that I've never understood. Um, so there is there's an important difference there, right? So exa for example, uh, when you get news that AIDS has been somewhat cured, i.e. they develop very good treatment that if you keep taking the treatment you basically have no symptoms and you will live almost as long as a normal person. That is very different news from HIV has been cured, i.e., let's say we, we'd had a vaccine against HIV. That would be something very different. Right? That's very, that's a, it's very different to go, hey, I can take a vaccine and then I can just fuck anybody I want without a condom and I won't get that STD, get all the others. <clears throat> Yay for syphilis. But like, you know, I won't get that one. Um, that's very different to shit. I got it now. Now I have to take this medicine for the rest of my life, and it's very, very expensive. Let me tell you, <laughs> extremely. Um, and then maybe I'm lucky and I won't get the symptoms and I won't die like 30 years early. Um, that's that's very different, and that's a that's a thing. I think if you in the job of talking to a lot of people, then you should get that right. And that's why I belabel belabor this point um but i am I, I think it's good that we had this discussion and i i understand barry um i mean i'm i'm a troublemaker right so i will correct everybody on this like even my friends and they'll go oh fuck they'll like roll their eyes this is probably also why i don't have that many friends um but to be fair a, a lot of my friends 
are scientists and uh, quite a few are doctors, like medical doctors. And they do get it wrong sometimes because propaganda just fucking seeps into your brain, right? And I will belabor this point with them. I'm like, actually, okay, so you, you're writing a paper right now. You put COVID-19 in the headline. Are you act And this literally happened. Did you actually mean COVID-19? Like I was kind of unofficially editing the paper because it was English and people fall back on me for like, you know, because I studied linguistics. Uh, can you have a look? And I'm like, did you actually mean COVID-19? Don't you mean SARS-CoV-2? And in this case, it turned out, yes, it was COVID-19. But, you know, I will belabor that point because especially as a scientist and as especially if you're writing, publishing about this. Um, and as a doctor, you should you should know better. Um, and that's not to say they all do, right? There's a hell of a lot of papers on PubMed where they say COVID-19 and they don't mean it. I think a lot of it is because PubMed is like any other internet search engine and it's keyword driven. And you have, like, if COVID, if people search for COVID because of the propaganda. That's the fucking uphill battle. I know we're fighting uphill battle. I know we'll lose that battle. I know language uh, is fluid and it uh, adapts with use. And that's why English has Viking words in it because they fucking came over and raped and pillowed. <laughs> pillowed? <laughs> Pillaged. Pillowed. They raped and pillowed. They hit people with pillows so much that they started accepting their weird language, their weird words in their language. I mean, that's what happens. But these time spans are longer than fucking two and a half years, generally. I mean, they're probably sped up with the internet, but I think we should, I think it's a fight. It's 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 a hill I'm, um, I'm willing to die on. You don't have to, I will. Uh, that's my job. Anyway, let's wrap up the show. I've been here long enough. This has been already been going on for an hour and a half. And you'll you'll get another show on Wednesday, so I don't think you can complain. Um let's let's go into the last segment, the final final segment of the show. I tell you how this thing works. Listen up, pal. This is how this works. Uh, I give this to you for free. Do with it, with it whatever you want. But if you derive value from it, please consider giving something back. It's called the value for value model. Um, you can become a patron on Patreon. Uh, link is on private system or press. There's also it's a monthly thing. You can also uh, send a one-off contribution to producers at fab.industries via PayPal. And we are, we are, I am researching other ways to make that more anonymous and stuff. And uh, some listeners have given me some nice tips and I'll be working on that. Yeah, and you will be helping out. I'm having discussions once in a while. I had this recently again um, where people write me and like, oh, I'm an old Lynx Outlaws listener. Or I like, you know, Geek News Radio, that one episode. And uh, is that available somewhere? And I always tell them, look, I got them somewhere on a backup drive on in some fireproof safe somewhere. Uh, but I don't have them handy. And they're certainly not on the internet somewhere to download. And most of that is just, um, you know, I got this lovely uh, server from Bayernmark that they're providing for free. Uh, more details in a bit. Um, but that has limited space. It also somewhat has limited bandwidth. So I can't just, you know, keep serving like... 15 year old podcast episodes i need that space for the stuff i'm doing now and the downside of doing this for free like completely for free back in the day with hello and geek news radio and now on a you know I, I got supporters i got producers and they help out but you know let's be honest the money i'm getting for this like if i had to host those files myself that would all be gone and then i wouldn't have an incentive to do new episodes. I'm trying to, you know, I'm a freelancer. I try to, I need to earn money where I can. I'm trying to do that somehow. I'm not trying to guilt you into, uh, you know, become a producer. Or, you know, you can be a producer by just writing. That'd be awesome. I can guilt you into that because you just need to provide some feedback. Pretty much anybody can do that. But, um, you know, you don't have to pay me any money. I'm just saying that the downside of having that for free is I can't keep those episodes around. I know I could put them on. I know. They should be on Internet Archive. But to be honest, I've had that on a to-do list literally since LO ended. And 
I got limited time in the day, right? I got to write articles. Uh, I'm hosting webinars. Sometimes I do some ghost writing or write other stuff. I write a novel on the side. I stream on Twitch. When I'm gaming, I'm streaming. I'm like, I basically have no, I have very limited free time. I spend, I get up pretty late, nine in the morning. Uh, and then I pretty much work till two o'clock at night with like a break for maybe a bit of running, some, you know, some kickboxing exercises. Um, sometimes I cook, sometimes I make bread. You know, I take some breaks in the middle. Sometimes I play a game for an hour or so um, or longer. But, you know, I work a lot. I work a lot. I work on the weekends. I work all all the time. Not to, you know, I, I'm not making you feel bad. That's just me. I'm a fucking workaholic. And let's be honest, nobody does podcasts for free if they don't love it. But, like, the downside of all of that is and of not selling you out to advertisers, having you tracked, you know, selling my soul out to advertisers. Um, the downside of that is I have limited resources. I have limited time, so I can't fucking put the... I can't put those. Like, I, I don't have the bandwidth. I don't have the storage. And, and I don't have the time to, to, to get out the old episodes out of the... Like, whenever the, the, the choice comes up, like, get the LO episodes or the Geek News Radio, you know, have to sort them, clean them up, put them somewhere. Instead of doing that, I'd rather do another podcast. I'd rather do another episode of this show for the people that are listening right now. Um... Anyway, if you're interested in pitching in, go to privatecitizen.press, privatecitizen.press, and you will find, you just go to some show notes, uh, you know, for some episode, these are episode 92, and you will find a section down at the very bottom, they're long show notes sometimes, um, mostly, under, oftentimes under the feedback, called Toss a Coin to Your Podcaster, which is a reference to the excellent Witcher show on Netflix with Henry Cavill, which is brilliant with a brilliant song, Toss a Coin to Your Witcher. Um, and all the details are on there. And now, before I leave, I would like to thank everybody who brought you this very episode because they pitched in. So thanks to Georges, Steve Hose, Butterbeans, Jonathan M. Heavy, Michael Mullen-Jensen, Dave, Michael Small, 1i11g, Jaroslav Lichtblau, Jackie Pleisch, Philipp Klostermann, Vlad, IKN, Bennett Piata, Kai Sears, Tobias, Fadi Mansour, Rodain the Insane, Joe Poser, Dirk Didi, Mode 7, Sandman 616, David Potter, Mika, Rizal, Martin, Avis, Mr. Amish, Dave Amrish, Drive Zero, Ricky M, Cam, Barry Williams, Jonathan, Captain Eckhead, RJ Tracy, Rick Bragg, D, Robert Forster, Super User, No Reply, and Astral C. And while I'm doing this, I'm just posting uh, the domain... I don't have a Twitch command for this. I really should. Uh, private citizen of press in Twitch chat because obviously I'm doing this live and, you know, some people might be interested to go there directly and uh, pitch in. There's a, there's a button if you want to become a patron. It's not really a button. It's an image. So it doesn't track you. <laughs> I mean, once you go to Patreon, you and all bets are off. You kind of have to subscribe, whatever. But like this page, this site, this, this private citizen of press, there's nothing embedded there. It doesn't track you. Um, I have to thank all my Twitch subscribers. Tweet, tweet, <laughs> uh, blah, blah, talking, speaking of Twitch, um, because they uh, support my Twitch channel, which is Foxtrot Alpha Bravo. Uh, alpha this is a NATO alphabet. That's it's with an F. That's how you spell Foxtrot Alpha Bravo, F A B. Um, yeah, and then you know they might be supporting my uh, my Icarus Beta weekend streams or whatever crazy stuff I'm doing. You know, game wise, or maybe this podcast, which I stream every Wednesday usually, uh, and then sometimes on Monday as well. Um, so thank you to Mike the Dane, Jonathan MH underscore com, Sandman six one six, Bacon the Pork, Mode Seven's unavailable, El Terrestris Jim, who was chiming in today as well, Galtaron, Redeemer F, and Butterbeans. That's Butterbeans from you know lots of these people support support the show in multiple ways, which I enjoy. And it's butter beans, as in the old Flickr uh, Web 2.0. God, rem remember Web 2.0? Remember that shit? Holy crap. Um, yeah, and with that, uh, also thanks to Bindmark, because, uh, as I mentioned before, they provide free servers, two servers, in fact, that I use as kind of a, like a CDN to give you the audio files. And they come down really fast, and I don't have to pay for it, uh, which otherwise would probably sync this show so thanks to Bytemark, bytemark.co.uk. They're an amazing cloud hoster from the UK and a good 
show of interoperability across the UK and EU borders. Um, and let's leave. Uh, I'm going to play you out with a song. Uh, but first, I have to mention Acoustic Roots, with the, which is the theme suit, th theme tune of the show by Raul Cabezali. Actually, JJ Guevara just subscribed uh, while I'm reading this out. So thanks. Thanks, Mr. Guevara. Um, I would like to light a... Take the Bezos dollars. Yes, I will. Thank you. Um, I, would, I would like to light a cigar right now, but my wife would kill me. Um, uh, thanks. I appreciate it. Um, they were uh, mentioning earlier before I started the show that uh, they're an old school uh, Six Gun Productions listener. So, you know, thanks Outlaws, Geek News Radio Day. So I enjoy that very much. I will put your name in the show notes, uh, you know, retroactively. Anyway, uh, thanks to Raul Kabazali, Acoustic Roots. I love that song. It's amazing. And I'm going to play you out with a song from the Epidemic Sound catalog which i've licensed so i can i can stream it i can put it in a podcast it's pretty cool um and this song is called breathe in breathe out uh, by Mat matthias tell so uh see you on wednesday if everything goes according to plan until then um aim to misbehave and uh tell it matthias tell it <laughs>
can talk again uh sorry i needed to obviously live play this into the audio track let's save it uh yes thanks uh gg uh jj jj guevara for the uh for the support i appreciate it just put you in the show notes um yeah dan uh we don't actually uh really talk that much these days but it's not by design i think i think we just i don't know it's the same brexit pandemic i don't know i know he's doing a new show some music stuff which I haven't listened to. I will. Um, you always give me things to think. Uh, I hope so. I think that's a that's a good compliment. It's one of the best compliments you can give somebody. Uh, I feel like let's put the alerts back on in case somebody else subscribes. <laughs> Not sure. Uh, wait, I need to go to that screen to also turn it back on. Um, yeah. Thanks for watching. Uh, thanks for being there. Uh, hope hope I'll see you again in chat. It's always fun to uh, chat with people obviously on the when i record the podcast i can't do it that much but uh yeah it's just you know for the for the audio listeners it's just better that way um yeah i'll be back on wednesday with another episode uh if everything goes according to plan wednesday night i'm playing for eight o'clock but it's probably going to be later like uh today um and uh, i'm gonna hand you over now uh, i'm gonna rate aqua fps I was going to raid some other uh, was a crack, but he just went offline. I think why I was yeah he he was finished with his stream. So let's raid uh, Aqua FPS. Who is playing? Uh, fucking what's it? Uh, the Cycle Frontier. I have no idea what the fuck that is, uh, but Aqua is a nice guy. Um, it's really cool. It's probably is he? Did he just end his stream as well? What the fuck? Did he just die? Uh, because his camera is fucking gone. What the hell? He just started the stream. He's got to be back, though. Uh, wait, let me just turn on the audio. Set up. I, I set it up oh, so there I he is. Flip back and forth between the two. He just Hopefully fucked up his fucking... Now. He just fucked think? up something. Anyway, let's raid Aqua FPS. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be back next Wednesday. Thanks for watching. I appreciate it a lot. Um, goodbye. Goodbye.